Om Brahmanandam Paramasukaram Kevalam Ganamurtim Dandwaiti Tam Gagana Sadrusham Tatvama Shadi Laksham Ekam Nicham Vimalamachalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Bhavati Tam Trigunarahitam Sadgurum Tan Namami Om Shanti 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 We salute the leader of our souls, through whose grace our ignorance is dispelled, who is beyond good and bad, pleasure and pain, life and death, and all other pairs of opposites. We recognize that one as the only witness to the changing phenomena of this universe. May we, through that grace, go beyond darkness and delusion and realize the truth in this very life. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Tat Sat. On Sunday mornings, it is our great privilege and also our predilection to gather together for meditation <coughs> before dawn so we can watch darkness turn into dawn uh, that is outside inside we're just watching all light we hope <coughs> the sun of her wisdom never rises nor sets as we say in our tradition it's just one non-dual sun and some of the questions today for our satsang are about advaita that is non-duality and and uh, so we will take these questions in order and here in the new year hopefully come up with some good edifying answers about the nature of divine reality and our connection to it or as Dvaita Vedanta would say our oneness with it connection to it uh, happens, of course, when relativity and reality are considered to be two different aspects. <clears throat> and of course, that line of demarcation between the absolute and the relative is is what we're trying to erase in meditation, and which goes away temporarily in deep sleep and makes one wonder about the ability of the mind to formulate and dissolve name and form and time and space. And to get beyond its karmas, that is the cause and effect that's going on, in other words, to transcend maya, nama rupa desha kalanimitta, time, space, and uh, name, form, time, space, and causality. So, in that vein, which we always entered into when we think of the term satsang, uh, sangha, gathering in, in one body to hear and discuss the truth, sat, or the truth of existence, then we can take these questions. The first one is, please explain Christ's teaching about wanting to make his followers fishers of men. What is the Advaitic meaning, and how does it apply to the householder living in the West? Well, first of all, there's no Advaitic meaning to it <laughs> at all. Uh, that is, except its underlying substratum, of course. Everything is built on the substratum of Advaita Vedanta, or non-dualism. That's the string running through the pearls that Sri Krishna talks about in the Gita. The second half of that question is more apropos. How does it apply to the householder living in the West? That is, the teaching of, come, I will make you fishers of men. That's uh, exactly where the teaching is given on what we would call the qualified non-dual level and on the level of sadhana, or you might say even precluding sadhana, just having a spiritual awakening so that one feels the need to do sadhana. That's all by Mother's Grace too. So in a, in a sense, it's all Advaitic, as I was saying. That is, we feel like she not only gives us the time of awakening, and gives us the desire to do sadhana, but she also gives us enlightenment, finally. It gives us that moment of higher samadhi where we transcend mind and body and senses and disprove the 
sub-reality of the world and prove to ourselves the I and my father are one quotient or what we would call a mahavakya or absolute truth in Vedanta like tattvamasi that, that thou art is, uh, that means Brahman and thou is the apparently separated self and then tvam means the relationship between the two that thou art they've gone into long long pages and chapters and tomes on their meaning of that uh, uh, from the standpoint of qualified non-dualism speaking towards the Advaita so that's what uh, we have to do with many of Christ's teachings this one is given more on the qualified non-dual level meaning uh, first of all you have to have a spiritual awakening so um, get yourself a spiritual life you have loaves and bread and fishes and wives and nets and river he saw that they had everything given to them by the grace of really by the grace of their own minds and their own incarnation as pure and simple folk but what they didn't have was the developed spiritual life I would call that lack of memory of their true nature not that they didn't have a true nature because Advaita states that everything is divine and and uh, even even the demoniacal must be turned into the divine you must transmute poison to nectar as we were speaking of last week at least that's the yogic way we we're speaking of that in class last week and we'll also take it up this afternoon at 2.30 for our live streaming class here. So when you say fishers of men, he says come, but before you come you must uh, have this spiritual awakening. So he would give them teachings that would uh, help them to remember. That's In Sanskrit that word's called smriti. And uh, if you want to go deeper into the teaching of memory so that we just don't get stuck in in memorabilia or in uh, photographs and stories about the past which uh, don't have that much bearing on our on the present anymore and possibly not even on the future we want to go deeper into memory we call it smriti bedu or a subtle memory or even a causal memory back inside of your mind not your brain but back inside of the mind complex that uh, has stored all those memories of import. Those memories are why you took an incarnation this time, by the way, to come back with some sort of essence of, of the experience that you extracted and brought with you so that that makes you, as Vivekananda says, who you are. That's your Parabdha karma, present karma that you took from the past makes, it shows you who you are and where you're at at the present moment as a as a, an apparently individualized soul, that is, uh, if you've drawn yourself out from the whole, and, and and that's called the ego mechanism. So, stored in that ego mind mechanism, sometimes they call it the antakarna, the inner organ, the inner cause of all things. Karna means cause. So the mind only schools are thinking in terms of the mind being the cause of all this outwardly. Even objects came from the mind. The power to solidify is in the mind. The power to dissolve and liquefy is also in the mind. That's earth and water, basically, when you're talking out here on this level, uh, this plane of existence. But inside there, of course, there's the power to homogenize everything into uh, everything external and internal into one indivisible state and then meditate on that state and be free. That's how... Shankar describes it in the Viveka Chudamani, the crest jewel of, of discrimination, that great scripture. So a spiritual awakening has to happen first, and then once some meditation, manana, uh, rolling it around in your mind, these teachings that Christ gives you and other great souls, uh, mature, then you can be about making fishers of men, and that would be, of course, awakening other souls to their true nature. <clears throat> so that's really the import of a teaching like that. Uh, and people throughout the ages have gotten that teaching from their teachers. Um, a, a sort of command, as it were, uh, depending on how, what, what kind of an imperative it is. If, if it might be an invitation to wake up. Uh, but maybe uh, if the situation is more dire, it would be a command. Come and wake up 
oh mind, wake up, you must, you must, uh, because you're wasting this life. Uh, time is being frittered away in mundane, superficial preoccupations, and you're not getting to the essence of the matter. That's sort of a feeling that we all have back in our mind, uh, that the time is wasting and death is on the way and causes people to brood and, and uh, waste their time further. So this command to wake up comes. And if you're very fortunate, it would come to you from a Krishna or from a Buddha or from a Christ or from a Ramakrishna. And uh, in fact, Swami Vivekananda used to, at his retreats, go around in the morning and wake everyone up by saying, Arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. Which is a uh, sloka out of the Upanishads. And he would come in upon you at four or five in the morning and open your door and shout that out to you as a declaration that you should wake up off your bed and sit for meditation, as we did this morning at six before, uh, before dawn. So uh, you find yourself uh, remembering your divine nature when you respond and obey those commands from on high. And uh, that will come slowly at first, depending on how sleepy you are, how sleepy you've been, in this lifetime. It's not just <clears throat> physical sleep that we're awakening from, <coughs> but um, the sleep of ages, if you want to call that, mula vidya, or the sleep of ignorance. And we wake up and you still go around, the song says, with eyes wide open and function, your senses all functioning perfectly, you still walk around blind, O oh soul. So wake up, wake up. So there are many, uh, teachings about that. In fact, if you want a more inviting teaching about it, Sri Ramana Maharshi used to, to give that by saying that this was uh, dream number one and dream number two, that is waking and dreaming, are both states of dreaming. And so it's a very interesting thought to think that maybe I should wake up from my waking state into, into higher reality. So that's the kind of thinking that you'll find evident in the and the uh, Indian seers and the mind-only philosophies and schools that we adhere to when we want to practice spiritual life. We want to practice religion and morality and we want to practice uh, scholastic uh, practices and all that, then fine, but when you want to go to spiritual life then you'll have to, to uh, find a good teacher and, and try and waken yourself up to these higher teachings, the Dharma it's called, and become an illumined soul. So as of how it applies to the householder in the West, then you want to awaken others. So you have to become fishers of men. So that means you have to qualify yourself first so you don't give out the wrong teachings or give them out in an immature way. And once you're ready to do that, then I would say it starts with your children to give them the Dharma. First thing you want to teach them is that they have an eternal soul and that the soul is divine, not sinful. Uh, libel of libel, it's the greatest sin to call another sinner, as Vivekananda said, so you don't harp on sin and damnation and all that, you harp upon the original and teach the original nature of the soul as being pure and perfect. And that would be the first uh, thing you want to do to a, to a, a young soul, so to speak, that is, um, needing your help. As Christ also said, you referred to your children not being your own, they're just souls under your care. So the first thing you want to do with a soul under your care, who has such a young body and is starting over afresh and is not awakened yet to spirituality, is tell them about the indivisible soul or that is one, not many, and uh, that is divine by nature and not sinful. In fact, you don't even need to bring sin into it. It's just guide them towards this idea of divine nature and let their natural goodness come out. There are some scars in the mind of a young child uh, and, and those need to be brought up, good some scars. There are also negative some scars there and mixed some scars. Some scar means an impression from a past lifetime. It's really uh, a great teaching in the Dharma and the only thing that really makes sense out of our situation in Maya or in relativity and our memories and things that go beyond our instincts and beyond heredity and beyond genes, uh, but go back to the intelligent particle in our mind. 
So we want to awaken that, Smriti Bedu, awaken to those, that bounty of uh, divine teachings that are in us and that we've been given from lifetime to lifetime. And uh, remember it and act on it. So you awaken that up in the young soul and then you can tell them further how the soul is indivisible and, and uh, how it exists in everything, not just in you, but in your friends and parents and others, especially realized in the seers and the rishis and your teachers, and how it even exists in nature at the foundation of every form. And you'll teach like that, and then you are a fisher of men and of women and of uh, all souls at that point. And uh, then life will uh, vibrate in a divine way, as it should. And as they asked Vivekananda, should a man be reborn? And he said, I certainly hope he will not be reborn, not until he can do so in full consciousness. So when you look out on this, in this day and age, 2014, second millennia, they call it, uh, millennium, and then you see all these people out there, uh, how many of them are awakened spiritually? And how many are even fishers of men? Uh, or are they still sleeping and uh, unawares of their true nature and buying into untenable, unacceptable um, idiosyncrasies of religion like eternal damnation and original sin? And those, those are meant to be symbolic, if anything. Uh, or maybe even be best to be done away with and bring out these deeper axioms of truth that Advaita speaks about, that the soul is one and indivisible and it's divine in its nature and so forth. So then you can truly call yourself a fisher of men and you can begin the work as a householder of uh, raising dharmic children and gathering together your friends in neighborhoods into the dharma spreading the teachings uh, of the Dharma so that beings can even awaken themselves. All you need to do is give them a start. So there's uh, an answer to that question. Another question which I heard yesterday in email came in. Advaita seems to me to be associated with Divine Mother rather than with God the Father. Why is this the case? Well, probably the questioner is thinking about the class last week and and lately, the classes we've had called Shakta Advaita Vada, whereas we're mating up Shakti, the Divine Mother Power, with Advaita, non-duality, as a path. And you put those two things together, so the questioner might be thinking, well, we're hearing so much about Mother in, in, in relationship to Advaita, to non-duality. What about the Father? Well, the idea here is that the Father can't express Advaita can only be Advaita. The Almighty Father, Paramashiva, and of course, Paramashakti too, when you look at Divine Mother and her essence, you also call her non-dual. So the you know, power of Shakti is, is just very unique though, is that Shiva is called pure existence, pure knowledge, pure bliss, Satchitananda, that's the Father. If, if you can borrow that term for it, Almighty Father, if you want. Since we're talking in the vein of Christ and Christianity too. Um, but Mother is the, is the uh, essence, the, the dynamic essence inside of that. Like a snake has a wriggling power. And sometimes it's still and sometimes it wriggles across the ground. So uh, that same snake has both the, the, the static and the dynamic in it, doesn't it? And like fire has the power to burn in it and water has the power of wetness in it and so forth. The mind, as we were just saying, has the power of solidifying and liquefying or solidifying and dissolving in it. So we see these two as one and these are called higher dualities. If you get stuck in pleasure and pain or virtue and vice, then you haven't really gone very deep into uh, the kingdom of heaven within you. And so you're not going to be able to be a very good fisher of souls. Uh, so you're going to have to think in, deep, in, in terms of deeper, uh, more profound dualities like form and formlessness and bondage and liberation and, and uh, uh, projection and withdrawal, uh, 
creation and dissolution, those kinds of things that are going on all the time in terms of millions of souls in many, many different realms, not just the physical realm. You have to start opening the box and thinking beyond it, getting out and getting free and looking out as a witness upon everything that's going on, not just upon the physical world because there you're looking at phenomena and phenomena is constantly changing. You might have noticed if you took apart a part of physical particle it's always changing, at a billionth of a second, in fact. So if everything is built on that kind of sand, then you can see why Christ said, Christ said you know, build your house on bedrock. You have to start looking for deeper, more profound, more stable, more lasting principles that don't change. That's the essence of the Advaita right there on duality. I and my Father are one type of speak. So in that case, then, uh, Divine Mother is the vehicle, the profound vehicle for expressing non-duality. Um, Shiva won't move out of that position. Static, supine, uh, she dances on his chest is the tantric vision you see. So she comes up out of his heart and expresses everything that's in that static reality and gives it name and form and time and space and causality all springs out of that. And it's meant to spring out in the most sattvic and harmonious way. And so when you approach it from seemingly outside, then you must look for the inside core and, and, and compare that to your inside core. And then you express what's in Shiva. So you become Divine Mother's vehicle. Uh, haven't you heard you, sh you should be cut in the image of the Divine? Well, that's because the human form is Divine. It is, a, it is a template for divinity. Everything on it, if you look deeply, is divine. And if you look into nature with that same eye, you'll also see divinity there. You'll see that one, divinity, that one reality in everything. So we salute Divine Mother then, and then uh, she acts rather like the Son that ushers you into the presence of the Father. You can get to the presence of non-duality th through... Uh, duality and qualified non-duality. Don't um, misunderstand by rendering the, the subject all into gender, like male, female, and neuter. Uh, that's a triputi you can meditate on, because there are divine male and divine female and all that, no doubt. Avatars, quite often divine males. But basically you have to look more toward the philosophical underpinnings when you talk about non-duality that transcend dualities like male and female. So when we say Almighty Father and Divine Mother, we're, we're not speaking just in terms of gender, we're speaking in terms of very deep philosophical tattvas or mahatattvas, divine principles that are rule of thumb in the realm of realized souls. And they know these inside out. And they come to us through the Dharma, and Mother brings us the Dharma. See, in fact, she brings us four fruits, right? Dharma is first, then Artha, wealth, then Kama, fulfillment of desire, then Moksha, freedom in the end. The four fruits of life are, are an ultimate teaching in Divine Mother reality, and it explains it all very well. It's all coming out of the, out of the One. So we must turn and point ourselves towards the one. When uh, I used to visit my friend, uh, a Sufi teacher, Pir Vilayat Khan, he was busy writing his divine mass called Towards the One, which started out with the words, Towards the One, everyone would recite that, you see. So uh, we used to play music together. So that's the idea. You turn away from belief in the many and you begin to concentrate on Knowledge of the One, and then, you or, then you're oriented right. That's actually the first of the Eightfold Path, isn't it, of Lord Buddha? Right orientation. Cannot begin anything without right orientation. And that really comes to this next question, which is a very good one. During the Mantra Tapas retreat, that's Mantra Austerity we did recently, you mentioned that intensification is not good if the mind is unclear. In spiritual life, we are told to intensify our sadhana if we want to make progress in the beginning and intermediate stages. In the beginning of spiritual life, there is a lot to understand. What is the discrimination to use so that one is not intensifying an unclear mind? 
or I could change that question to a statement again. Is yes, use discrimination. Not what is the discrimination to use, but use discrimination to make sure you're not intensifying an unclear mind. So it may be a bit um, contradictory or contradictory sounding to say that we shouldn't intensify our spiritual practice in the early stages. <coughs> but usually you'll find that people's capacities are not able, the lack of capacity that is, they're not able to intensify anyway. So the question doesn't really come up. They're just, as we were said earlier, awakening. Fishers of Men's Station has not happened yet. You see, they're just awakening to spirituality and they need to really ground themselves in that. It's called qualification. And to qualify yourself is, is the mainstay of spiritual practice called sadhana. You want to do that first and you want to spend a good five, ten more years, if needed, in qualifying yourself so that when you do hear the truth from a teacher, it rings clear to you, you meditate on it, you get free. It all happens within, well, if you use Swami Vivekananda's uh, opinion, six months. But he's talking about probably Hindu folk, you see, that have that in their very samskaras. Uh, they've been raised on that. They're not just a, a moral uh, culture, which we're hoping we are nowadays in the West, in, in America. They're not just a moral culture. They're a culture that's been raised in the Dharma for thousands of years, and their children have been raised in the Dharma. Everyone knows Atman, and everyone knows Brahman, and everyone knows Vedanta and Tantra and Upanishads and Gita. It's a part of the very culture there, and it's in their minds, in their minds, samskaras, impressions. So this question then uh, is that once your mind is clear, then you begin the intensification, intensification process. You know, be careful what you pray for, it comes to mind. Uh, say if you begin praying for things that aren't really worthy with an impure mind, then you may get these things and that may really ruin your life, as we've seen in many cases. So. You want to be real clear about what to pray for. You want to be real clear about what to meditate on and how to meditate. You want to be real clear on how to interpret those scriptures. You want to be very clear on how you do the puja, how you do the worship of the Lord, so as not to make any mistake or offend any deity. There's so many ways in which you need to be clear. <laughs> clarity. Khyati, it's called, in both Buddhism and Vedanta. You need to have that clarity first, then when you have that clarity, the rain cloud of virtues come out of the inner skies and soak you to the bone. You get wet with the Dharma. Wet with devotion, if you want to put it that way. Devotion to the Dharma or devotion to the truth. So, uh, if you take the other scenario, then basically you start to, uh, with an unclear mind, start to do these intense practices and that's where you get mentally imbalanced people and aspirants began to go off the mark and then also uh, you see uh, uh, spirituality began to be associated with madcaps and so forth you see with, with uh, mystics as a class which are sometimes uh, not real mystics at all Myst mysticism should be uh, the view of something very clear and very true very apparent as truth not a bunch of hidden mumbo jumbo somewhere, some queer yogiism back somewhere that's hidden away by some cults or something. It's got to be very clear and very direct and very non-dual, based in the non-dual, and with the Dharma as its testament. Uh, Shruti, uh, the scriptures that you hear, which are non-dual, must be heard first, and that's the pramana, the very proof of the matter, is hearing these scriptures from the lips of an illumined soul, who got it from another illumined soul, <coughs> from people who know the essence of the scriptures. So with that kind of clear understanding, you intensify and immediately spiritual progress is made. Without that kind of clear understanding, you, you all of a sudden jump to some sort of premature austerities, like even minor austerities, like fasting or something. And you begin to imbalance the mind right away. The mind is very, very precariously balanced in the early stages. And if it, if it gets 
you, you know, come, I will make you teachers of men kind of teaching. Uh, there are so many dangers in which it, it uh, has to pass first in order to get itself stable and, ability, and able to really be able to reflect the Dharma in a true way. And the ego is one of those. So basically, you begin to call yourself a teacher early on, or you claim that you've had Nirvikalpa Samadhi and put it in some brochure you're putting out or something. If you had Nirvikalpa Samadhi, you wouldn't be in business. But to speak of printing brochures. So all of these strange oddities are there, you see, in the periphery of spiritual life, the, the pseudo level of things, both in charlatans and in followers. So you have to be very careful of that level and pierce through and ground yourself for years, study for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, steep yourself in the Dharma with good teachers and with accepted um, non-dual and authentic scripture based in your own deep and, and dedicated practice, all backed by devotion to the Lord and Mother of the Universe. And then uh, your mind is clear enough to intensify, you see. So intensifying prematurely is a good teaching. It came up recently and people have been talking about it here in SRV them about how to be careful how you intensify your sadhana <clears throat> and what perspective your mind has to take first and how you must scour it with scrubbing bubbles, say with mantra, like this question came from the mantra tapas retreat where we were doing the mantra austerity. Now mantra austerity is, is very pure and, and very safe. It's one of the safest of all practices. It's certainly much safer than the hatha yoga pranayama practice. Mantra will, will facilitate everything that hatha yoga and pranayama can do for you, but without the dangers. That's a quote from the Jagat Guru, Swami Brahmananda, a world teacher. He says, mantra Practice of mantra will do everything for you that hatha and pranayama can do, only without the dangers. So you can go ahead and recite the Lord's name even with a deluded mind, see, and it will be good effects for you. See, because it's a very simple practice, there's not a lot of effort to it, and it's divine by nature. Uh, you're coming closer to Brahman, and that's going to be good for any kind of mind coming closer and closer to the truth through the sun, as we were just saying. You get to the Father through the sun. So you get a mantra that usually consists of a power bijam <coughs> and the name of an avatar or the name of a god and goddess. <coughs> and you put that together uh, with one of these mantras, you see, and then you begin reciting it and the scrubbing bubbles are released in the deep subconscious and unconscious mind and begin to clarify right away. And then when you get that clarity, then you can begin to intensify in the areas of scripture, interpretation, meditation practice, and so forth. Because as I said before, people are not gaining uh, results and fruits out of their spiritual practice, particularly in the West and in this day and age. Uh, and they're falling away from the path and they're getting detoured and they're getting discouraged and so forth because of these um, early uh, onslaught of these early problems that come to you because you haven't qualified yourself uh, or clarified the mind. Right perspective is the first thing to do. Get the right perspective. Get into the right atmosphere. Find the right teacher. All those things have to be put together. So you can see by me going on and on like this about this one question how important it is to really clarify the mind as early as you can in spiritual life. But as far as the danger concerned there, it's really <clears throat> usually not uh, not assignable. It's basically, when people are at the very beginning of their spiritual life, they can barely keep up their spiritual life. They're not into the intensification period yet. They're very they're just beginning to pierce through the crust of Maya. Uh, that takes some effort, but that that will help. You know the beautiful teaching there by Sri Ramakrishna, he always gives you a simple teaching, is the egg and the mother bird. You see, the mother bird sitting on the egg. She got this far away look, you see. That's another story. But this egg she's sitting on, she keeps watching it and she keeps listening to it to hear any sounds of scratching from inside. And 
she'll hear maybe a little scratching and then she'll still sit on the egg. See? But then finally she's heard some pecking and scratching from inside the egg and she knows that the chick is trying to get out. So she begins to peck on the outside of the egg to help it break the shell so it can come out. She knows it's time. So the implication there is that Divine Mother knows the timing. She is auspicious timing. And in the case of a soul awakening up, she will be there when that awakening happens. And then the soul is rather on its own after that to come out of its shell and begin to seek right orientation. It has to seek spiritual life. If it seeks the world, if it seeks wealth, if it seeks fame, for the sake of wealth and fame, and, and God isn't in the picture, then the, that's a worldly person. That person is not qualified or ready yet for spiritual life, probably not even for religious life. For moral and ethical life, uh, you know, would be a start. But Dharma is another uh, deeper level inside. When you find the Dharma, you're on the trail of freedom. When you find religion, you're on the trail of, of, uh, of uh, or you find morality, you're on the, the trail of religion. But if you find the Dharma, you're on the trail of enlightenment. All right, one more question here. Two more. It says, what commentary did Shankara provide on the limb of yoga called asana? Well, there are, there is a commentary that Shankara, the father of Advaita Vedanta, sometimes he's called, did on Patanjali's eight-limbed yoga. It's beautiful. Maybe there were, you know, some five, six hundred years apart, those two beings. And actually, the father of yoga was supposed to, as an incarnation, Govindapada, was supposed to have been Shankara's teacher. So it's then very fitting and very apropos that Shankara would do, from his Advaitic position, a commentary on the Yoga Sutras. The Yoga Sutras, you wouldn't call them necessarily strictly non-dual. Any time of practice is concerned, non-duality is, you know, retreated. Non-duality is the statement of a perfection beyond practice. It's your true nature. And this, is, this gives people some problem. Uh, so it might make them disoriented a bit because they were thinking, well, if I want the Advaita, I want the essence, then I don't need to practice because practice isn't Advaita. So there's, it's really a problem there. You can't really understand the Advaita until you do sadhana and practice and purify the mind. Holy Mother used to say that, you know, the, the mind needs to be purified, not the soul. The soul is ever perfect. Yes, my dear, the soul is ever perfect. But you, you need to clarify and purify this, the mind complex first and to, and in order to get to the non-dual truth. That is, when the mind is purified, non-duality will be the obvious truth. But until then, you, you won't be able to see this non-dual essence yet. It'll be a far cry, and some people could even pretend it and never have reached it. So this is the idea here that, um, that um, one is going to need to uh, go through a practice that would include something like I'm doing right now, asana. So, so Shankara gave a 15-point commentary on the eight limbs of yoga. He turned the eight into 15. <laughs> that was his, his stroke of genius as he commentated on the eight-limbed yoga, Ashtanga yoga. And uh, that's, by the way, all of that is in, included in issue 10 of Nectar of Non-Dual Truth, an article I wrote on Advaita yoga. So you may look that up and read all of that, uh, five or six pages on Advaita Yoga. That's Shankara's commentary on Patanjali's yoga. So what he said basically about asana is that that single position in which meditation flows unimpeded, harmonious, that would be true asana. So single position, ekasana, not a bunch of positions. A bunch of positions would be, oh, I must have to get my body together somehow, and hopefully I won't get misled by hatha yoga and, and forget the other seven limbs, <laughs> which is happening a lot 
in today's world, especially in the West. They're not seeking enlightenment or samadhi, which is the eight limbs. And they're thinking they can meditate seventh limb without having um, you know, qualified themselves for it. So asana is the third limb of yoga, and yamas and yamas come first. Study of scripture. Have you studied and understood scripture before you sat in asana? Have you purified yourself before you sat in asana? Have you done tapas and austerities before you did asana? Have you understood the non-dual truth, satyam? Have you become non-violent, ahimsa? Those are all yamas and yamas that precede the posture. But once you do come to posture then, it's called ekasana. So Father Advaita Vedanta says, that single posture in which meditation can happen naturally and spontaneously, that's called asana. He says, otherwise, it's just like an old tree trying to stretch its limbs. See, creaking, see in the wind. In other words, the body's gonna die. Uh, you're not doing anything by uh, twisting your, your limbs into different shapes and so forth uh, if you don't understand that you must be headed for that single posture in which all meditation can flow spontaneously. In other words, meditation is the point. Seventh limb. Then maybe you might have samadhi if you can sit in one position long enough and if the breath, pranayam, can be stilled and if the body does not command your attention anymore, but Brahman commands your attention, then you're talking about true yoga. So that can be said about this commentary Shankara provided on all eight limbs of yoga in 15 points. Now the final question here, and we have just enough time for it. I remember you giving a teaching on the state of pure consciousness where it realizes itself to be absolutely distinct from matter, like the coconut, which when it ripens, has a natural separation between the kernel inside and the shell that contains it. I love that teaching, it, that simile, it is very helpful to me. But the separation being alluded to always made me think of the practice of prachahara. Will you please expound on the higher limbs of yoga in relation to this realization? for our benefit. And in particular, I'd like to know its relation to prachahara. So the teaching there uh, mentioned here is sattva purusha naitakyati. It means basically um, the purusha realizing itself as different from nature and its modes. Sattva is one of the modes of nature. Sattva means balance. Raja means uh, restlessness. And, uh, and, and then Tamas means uh, inertia or slothfulness, depending on whether you're talking about it in the mind or in nature. So the Purusha needs to transcend the three gunas and recognize itself as the source of everything, the essence, as we were just talking about earlier, Paramashiva, the essence. And uh, so the question here is, uh, it sounds like you're practicing Prachahara when you do that. But the answer is, is that Prachahara has been accomplished long ago uh, before this Satya Purusha Naitakiti kicks in, which would be more like the distinction between meditation and Samadhi, separating the soul from all form. Mm, you, in this Prachahara stage, quite often you're trying to separate yourself from habits, desires, thoughts about form, and concepts and so forth. And maybe on the external only, maybe you've only reached a level where you're trying to separate yourself from preoccupation with external things. That's the first half of the Prachahara practice. Uh, uh, and then the second half of it is, oh, now I've got all the things that I just tried to, that used to bother me, are now haunting me as thoughts. It's the, I have the same desires and habits that I had outwardly, and now I find out that I have them inwardly. And so it's actually a direct finger pointing towards the fact that everything comes from the inside out, not the other way around, and begins to give the soul a clue on how to be, live internally, 
and look outside as a witness rather than try to work from outside to inside if they even get that inclination in the first place. Many people don't, as I was saying earlier, they're not awakened yet. Maybe that egg that the mother bird's listening to will never even make a scratching sound. <laughs> Nothing in there, you see. It's a dead egg. So people who are awake only to the five senses and the five objects are, are quite uh, insentient because nature and the five senses are insentient. There's no, there's no real consciousness in them to speak of. And not consciousness of the non-dual sort, of the intense kind. So basically, when you're at a prachahara stage, fifth limb of yoga, you're beginning to detach from things, and that's the practice. And you detach outwardly first, and then you find out that the same things outwardly are haunting you inwardly. That's a direct signal to you that uh, everything outside has come from the inside. Purnamadaha, purnamidam, purnat purnamadachate. From the infinite, the finite has come. So you, right there in Prachahara, you should be making the shift. It's not just, oh, can I accomplish outward detachment and inward detachment? It's, oh, I see everything out. Side came from the inside. And right there the soul should all of a sudden get the clue and master prachahara in an instant. It's based on an insight, on a realization, not on effort. See. So how long will it take in effort for the person, that, the aspirant, to get that insight is the question really that the teachers are looking at. Is it, will he get the idea, you see? Or how long will it take them, you see? Hurry up so I can make you a fisher of mankind, you see. And, and so that's the difference between Prachahara and Satya, uh, Sattva Purusha Naitakyati. That's the difference. In Sattva Purusha Naitakyati, you've reached a stage in where you realize the soul need is definitely different than nature, you see. Like oil and water. Do they mix? And uh, you would say, yes, they do. You know, but in about 45 seconds, I'll just hold this here for you to see, in about 45 seconds, which I hopefully won't be 45 lifetimes for you, you will see the separation process between nature and the soul, that there are two different consistencies. That is, the soul is sentient and nature is insentient. I don't want to sound contradictory here. The soul is also in nature, but not as an object, not as a form, as an essence only. So when you look at nature, the reason it's so beautiful and so attracting is because it is in it, the, the reality is there underlying all forms. But it's never a form. So when the separation process happens, this is sattva purusha naitakiti, is that the wise soul is separating itself consciously out from nature because it knows they consist of two different things. The soul is never born. It's never created. It never takes a form. It only associates with a form, and so forth and so on. Those very same things that you wanted to teach your children, called the Dharma, very young, so they could become fishers of men. So, uh, you know, not necessarily a popular teaching because people are so attached to nature, and their bodies are in nature, and their minds are in nature, and death is in nature. But if you want to know your birthless, deathless self, your true nature, not nature as form, but your true nature as formlessness, then you're going to have to make the separation process. That happens in here, in the mind. And when it does, it's called Sattva Purusha Naitakiti in one of the Indian darshanas. And uh, yeah, it's called Koivalya in yoga. Patanjali called it Koivalya. It's a very, very high state, just penultimate to samadhi, where the soul realizes it's that it's formless and it separates itself out from nature and sees itself as the witness of nature. And at the same time, if it's a very profound and deep illumined soul, it will also see that nature has come out of it. <coughs> there is a stage that one can get caught in there, which you separate yourself from nature and say, nature is bad, nature is evil, nature go away, I'm just formless essence. And some people call that Advaita, you see. But I don't think that's mature Advaita. 
from everything that we've understood by great souls of the present, like Ramana Maharshi and Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa and Swami Vivekananda and Sri Sharda Devi, and souls of that very fine, uh, highly realized condition, uh, that true Advaita is all-inclusive. Uh, that so nature and soul are going to be seen as one. The line of demarcation is going to be struck away, and you'll see that one. How are they one? Because we just said they're not one. They're they're different. You see, they're two. So the way you understand that is uh, the nature has come out of the soul. They're not two separate realities. That there's one reality, and it has, like a snake. The power to be still and the power to move. It's that simple. It has fire and fire has its burning power. And when you understand that, then you make the connection between nature and soul and that's mature oneness. Otherwise it's immature oneness you're talking about. And the immature oneness is based on the fact that I don't know that nature has come out of me. The whole universe has come out of me. All worlds have come out of me. All worlds are within me. Doesn't it sound like the kingdoms of heaven are within you? you? See. So we started with Christ's teaching. We'll end with Christ's teaching. And here we will move on towards our afternoon class in which I hope all of you will join me in the teachings of the Dharma. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us. May peace be unto all.